Welcome to Cleveland Clinic, Florida. We're glad to have you. My name is Alan Lavinia. I am the PGY4 Chief Resident for the Internal Medicine Residency. Sorry for some of you who won't be able to experience the Florida sunshine firsthand, but we hope to convey the family feel that brightens up our residency as we work hard to foster a degree of overall wellness, camaraderie, and collegiality. Let's take a look at the schedule. Our rotations use the X plus Y system. In our case, it's a 6 plus 2 structure to balance out the combination between inpatient and outpatient rotations. Our blocks are organized into two-week blocks. A notable aspect of our program is the lack of a 24-hour call, which we have substituted with the day float, night float system. As you can see, the rotations with their a lot of blocks are listed below. What you'll notice is that you spend most of your time in your first year on the floors in general medicine. The reason for that is to build the basic foundation for the rest of your internal medicine career. As you progress towards your third year, you will have more elective time, upwards of six blocks in a given year. Another interesting aspect of our program is the vacation and holiday time. Most programs will offer 15 work days off and your five personal days. We've worked hard to accommodate a winter holiday schedule, which will amount to five more days off. Now, let's dive a little bit deeper into these rotations and show you around the hospital at the same time. Here's a glimpse into our outpatient clinic for which we use EPIC as our primary electronic medical record. Since we're here, let's talk about clinic or the ambulatory block. As mentioned earlier, you'll spend two weeks in your ambulatory block and the routine day starts like this. From 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. you have morning reading and mix app review with our acclaimed Dr. Minis. You'll then progress to your subspecialty or continuity clinics from 8 a.m. to noon. From noon to 2, you have a break for conference. This is your didactic time where we also like to eat lunch. And then in the afternoon, you'll return to your continuity clinic or subspecialty clinic. On average, you'll have 10 half days of continuity clinic and 8 half days of subspecialty clinic with one half day of administrative time built into your two weeks. During your continuity clinic, you have the opportunity to build your patient base seeing new patients looking for a primary care provider, seeing recently discharged patients following up after a hospitalization, conducting annual exams, conducting follow-up visits, and of course seeing that patient presenting to the clinic uh, with a particular problem like a headache. And then of course you have the associated work, following up on lab results, messaging or calling patients, counseling them on lifestyle modifications or changes to their medication regimen. You also have the eight half days of subspecialty clinic, which can be designated in a subspecialty of your choosing. Cardiology, nephrology, gastroenterology, you choose. Last but not least, you have protected didactic time on Friday mornings during your ambulatory block. Your first week, that first Friday, is dedicated to the simulation lab, where you'll get to practice some of the general concepts of medicine. For example, diagnosis and workup of various conditions, as well as some of the art of medicine how to give effective feedback, practical teaching points, and how to work cohesively as a team in a safe environment. That second week, on that second Friday, it's reserved for an academic half day, where you get to review outpatient medicine topics followed by board review, as well as our high-value care curriculum, working on the quality improvement projects we maintain throughout the year. Our ambulatory residents also prepare outpatient teaching rounds, which we'll get to a little bit later. Now let's transition from the outpatient to the inpatient setting. Our faculty uses a combination of bedside and table slash sitting rounds for teaching. Just to point out a few famous figures, on the left-hand side you will notice Dr. Petrowski hunched over his much shorter WOW, or workstation on wheels as we like to call them, as well as his medical student and resident-based team. In the top right corner you will notice Dr. Hagar seated with the computer in front of her. She is another one of our associate program directors whom you will get to meet later today. So we have three inpatient teaching teams, orange, blue, and green team. We also have a general medicine team staffed by our hospitalists, which you're welcome to join as an elective rotation. Our teaching teams are staffed with one attending, and then one second year or third year as a senior resident who supervises two interns and up to four medical students. Pharmacy residents and observers are always welcome to join rounds. In order to gradually get your feet wet, our team cap starts out at 14, which means seven patients per intern, and this gradually increases to 18, or nine patients per intern by the end of September. Your day on floors will begin around 6 a.m. 
This is when you'll get sign out from the night team regarding anything that happened to your patient overnight, or sign out from the night team regarding a new patient that they admitted to your team overnight. You'll talk to nursing staff regarding any issues they might have. You'll, of course, talk to the patient, do a physical exam, and start formulating a plan regarding all your patients that you have on your list. And then you'll run that plan with your senior resident before rounds. Rounds usually start between 8 and 9 a.m. And then you'll formally round with the team between 8 a.m. to noon. And then you'll take a break for noon conferences, your didactic time where you also get to eat lunch from 12 to 2. And then you'll finish up all your work by 5 p.m., signing out to the night internet night. And this is not to include those days when you're on call, which we'll talk about later. I guess we'll talk about it right now. Here's your typical on-call day. And by the way, your team is on call every three days. This is what you call a Q3 call system. From 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., you actually have the duties of a regular floor day, just as we discussed in the previous slide. But from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., you have the potential to admit patients, and most likely these patients are coming from the emergency department, but sometimes you'll have patients as outside hospital transfers that you directly admit. Now, you're still rounding in the morning, just as you do before, with your old patients that you have. From 12 to 2, you still have your didactic conferences. But again, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m., as you're doing your work for your old patients, you're still admitting patients up until 7 p.m. when the night team transitions care. And then you'll sign out to the night floor intern. Time to recuperate is important. So on the weekends, one intern will come in per weekend day, giving the other intern the day off. And if you're not on call, you can sign out your patients once you've completed your work in the afternoon. No presentation would be complete without talking about our intensive care unit, which houses some of the sickest patients in South Florida. In the ICU, residents come a little bit before 6 a.m. to receive sign-out on their patients. In the morning, they pre-round gathering information about ventilator settings, drips, discussing overnight events with the nurses. They then round with the multidisciplinary team and continue their work for the rest of the day. Our resident teams in the ICU alternate call every other day, with one intern and resident team leaving at 4 p.m. and the other leaving at 6 p.m. Each team also gets one full weekend on and works the other full weekend in this two-week block. Think of the swing shift as the night shift. You'll have a swing one intern in the ICU, and you'll have a swing two intern in the floors, and by the next week, remember you're a two-week block, that second week you're going to switch roles. The one um, intern that was in the ICU will now be on the floors, and the other intern that was on the floors will be in the ICU on that second week. Now let's talk about your responsibilities on the floors at night. At 6 p.m., you come in and you get sign-out from all the teams. This sign-out will include things like things to follow up, things to consider when taking care of the patients at night. Now hopefully things will be quiet and uh, the patients will be asleep and there will be no issues from the patient or the nursing staff, and sometimes that's not the case. That's why you have a pager. From 7 to 12 a.m., you'll be admitting patients and addressing your floor pages. Now at 12 a.m., you'll stop admitting new patients and from 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., you're going to finish your work on the patients that you admitted while still addressing the floor pages. But at some point before 2 a.m., you're going to start transitioning the pager to the other intern in the ICU. And then at 2 a.m., your shift is over. You go home, you sleep, getting ready for the next shift. Now switch on over to the ICU. This intern's coming in also at 6 p.m. They're going to receive sign out from the day team, things that happen during the day, things to follow up at night. But from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., you're going to be admitting patients. The ICU never sleeps, right? You're going to be admitting patients all night for the next 12 hours. You're going to be doing something called night notes from 6 to midnight. You're going to be addressing floor pages when the floor intern leaves from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. as the pager transition to you. And again, you're, you're addressing admissions to the ICU during your entire shift. And at 6, around 6, 6.30, after you sign out to the day team that came in, you leave. Your shift is over around 6 a.m. And then you start it all over when you come back in the next day at 6 p.m. And then again, after this first week is over, the two interns, they switch roles. That one intern in the ICU is going to the floors, and that floor intern is going to the ICU. As I mentioned earlier, we take care of some of the sickest patients in all of South Florida. So it's not uncommon to see patients, multiple patients, on advanced modes of supportive care, from the mechanical ventilator to intraaortic balloon pumps to ECMO, you'll see patients receiving hypothermia cooling protocol post-cardiac arrest, 
and all, a lot of these patients in the ICU will have central lines for a multitude of drips going in that includes vasopressors and sedatives, arterial lines going in their radial artery so we can measure their hemodynamics second by second. One common question that uh, pros prospective applicants ask is whether our interns and residents have enough access to procedures. Unlike larger programs where lines and procedures can be hard to find or residents may be competing for them, most of our interns and residents within the first few weeks to months, they play several central lines and arterial lines and they become proficient by the end of the first year. In addition, we're complementing their procedural experience with a point of care ultrasound curriculum. And here are some of the procedures that you get to do, including uh, the central lines and arterial lines. You'll get to do plenty of paracentesis, endotracheal intubations, you'll do thoracentesis, and you'll do some lumbar punctures too if you're very eager to work with neurology. Now let's turn to our electives and selectives. Selectives are rotations which are required and complement the general scope of internal medicine. These are things like cardiology, pulmonology, and gastroenterology. And then there are electives like rheumatology, dermatology, women's health, and so on. You're welcome to take advantage of these elective rotations. There are many of them. And as you progress through the years, you'll have increasingly more blocks of elective time in addition to your subspecialty clinic time. Residents also have an opportunity in their second and third year to rotate at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio or another hospital of your choosing. It's no wonder why our residents have had tremendous success in our ABIM board passing rates for the past seven years. I mentioned this earlier, but during our clinic and elective rotations, you have morning reading club with Dr. Meniz. This reading club is where you review MixApp in great depth, going chapter by chapter, question by question, in small groups. What you see here is when we used to do it in person, but when COVID hit, we transitioned to virtual. And now we do things virtually from 7, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, this is a big help in making sure we instill a foundation of medical knowledge that helps us pass our boards, but also helps us in our clinical practice. Now let's spend a moment on noon conferences. Every day from 12 to 2 p.m. we have didactics with either Dr. Meniz, an esteemed subspecialty faculty, multidisciplinary conferences with, let's say, the pulmonary critical care department, journal clubs with our pharmacy and nutrition colleagues, as well as other visiting guest attendings. Our medical grand rounds on Wednesdays varies between subjects in general internal medicine, transplant, and imaging to give a well-rounded feel to the program. Personally, I love teaching rounds. I love that we insert this into our didactic curriculum because they're awesome. On Tuesdays, we do teaching rounds with Dr. Meniz, and we see how an expert diagnostician takes evidence-based medicine to the workup of a clinical vignette, you know, a case that we see here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and we just try to stump the professor with a hard case, but we never can because Dr. Meniz can diagnose all the zebras. On Thursdays, uh, we have teaching rounds with Dr. Petrowski, a favorite among the residents as we get to go over bread and butter pathology, the many bread and butter pathologies that we see here at Cleveland Clinic, and we get to go over clinical decision making and reasons and the whys of medicine, and it's great. On Fridays, we do outpatient teaching rounds with Dr. Sider and Dr. Hagar, our program director and associate program director, and we get to run through a case as we see them uh, present into the ambulatory clinic. It's important for our residents to become excellent educators, which is why we have intern talks, journal clubs, M&Ms, and ICU teaching rounds, all of which is resident run. We also spend time addressing other areas of medicine, including healthcare disparities and research throughout the course of the year. Our residents work extremely hard, and their record of publications and presentations throughout the past year alone stands as a testament to that. If I were to list every scholarly activity that our residents did all put together, I would not be able to fill all the slides of this presentation. Prior to COVID, we were attending national meetings on the regular. Even during COVID, we were sending in our research, they were getting accepted, we would present virtually. And now that we're starting to be in person, things are starting to go back to normal now, we're starting to get back to our national meeting presence. And we're always having a great showing at the American College of Physicians Conference, the ACP Conference. Speaking of ACP, our Emeritus Program Director, Dr. Jose Muniz, was recognized by the ACP for his outstanding contributions to medical education and his service as a clinician. This designation of master is given to a select few, and for that, we consider him a prized pillar of our program. 
One common question that applicants always ask is where do residents end up after we graduate? And here's a list of accomplishments over the past two years. We have some matches to pulmonary critical care all throughout Florida, and most recently we had one of, uh, one of my classmates match to Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Uh, one of the chief residents last year matched to Sleep Fellowship at UCLA. Uh, one of my classmates matched to Vanderbilt for nephrology. And as you can see through the rest of the list, we have some success in matching to very competitive specialties as well. Uh, myself, I'm a chief resident here, and uh, one of my classmates is a chief resident in Naples. And we have good hospitalist training over here too. People become hospitalists after they graduate. In addition to healthcare benefits, our residents also receive reimbursements for conferences, as well as stipends for books and board review materials, in addition to the board review course that is part of your third year. We get a gym membership, we get stipend for food, and we get an iPhone for communication within the hospital. All right, everybody, take a deep breath. We did it. There was a lot to that presentation. If you're lost or confused about any of the content, like the shift schedule, the call, the responsibilities of an intern or a resident. Just know that you have every opportunity to ask questions. In fact, at the end of this presentation, I'll leave some contact information. I advise you to clear up any of the confusion or issues that you might have. Just know, and to end this presentation, here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, the residents, we work really hard. We play hard too. Work-life balance is very important. We foster an environment of camaraderie here. Residency is very tough. The patients, um, the workload, the studying. We can also have some fun through this hard time too. Cleveland Clinic Florida's tradition of excellence includes this feeling of family. And we work for that every day. Sometimes you need a cafecito and you gotta celebrate a few birthdays. By the way, Dr. Benice will out outlive us all. This is my class. As, pro as promised, here is, uh, here's some contact information. I wish you guys the best of luck in your interview season, and I hope to talk to you soon.